Friday, May 2nd, 2014 edition of the Hagman Hagen Report. Our special guest, W, the Intelligence Insider. If you're wondering what any of this has to do with intelligence or how it connects to the dots, just hang with us. I guarantee you, you will be absolutely astounded when you hear uh, how this is all tied together. Please listen to this carefully because this is going to set the tone, I believe, for tonight. And the quote is this. In order to properly understand the big picture, Everyone should fear becoming mentally clouded and obsessed with one small section of truth. For those who don't know you, you have lived your life in the recesses, the shadows. Suffice it to say that you're uh, the real James Bond in, in my book and someone of, of a man of integrity, character, and a guy that, uh, that I would trust my life with. So we're going to just turn it over to you and just... Take us where you want to take us. Tonight, I want to try to try to get in the mind where some of the folks are coming from, how they got there, that are running the planet right now, and why they think what they do, where it makes sense, where there's actually some, some pretty good logic that got them there potentially. Because remember, it's not what you believe. It's what they believe who are running the planet right now that is really affecting how we live, because at this exact moment, the people that have the controls, they're, you know, a different group. And so we're trying to understand what's driving them, what's directing them, what are the principles, what are the ideas that cause them to think, function, do what they do, and what is the mindset or even the mind behind them that has gotten them and us here today right now where we are with all these events churning around us in the world and these burning questions arising and propelling us ahead seemingly to this new world order just ahead just around the corner what's the driver all right when the pharaohs were entombed when they passed away and the wealthy people of, of Egypt we now know we go back and we look at these sarcophagus and the burial chambers etc we know that the whole death process was a very elaborate process they went to extreme measures to mummify these individuals of prominence these people that they felt were godlike or in fact gods we look at it now with a modern mind and we think, well, they're just nuts, crazy. They were gods, I mean, you know, how uh, the height of arrogance. We have to think about it a little bit more. What, what were they really trying to do when they preserved their body in this way? Oftentimes they were buried with uh, their wives and servants and they were also preserved with the understanding, with the belief that, that one day they were going to be resurrected and would live again physically and we look at it and we think with our modern minds that uh, a little touched they didn't understand the nature of the world as Christians they didn't understand uh, salvation Christ hadn't arrived yet uh, they believed in you know voodoo there's been this allegation out there for some time that some hidden hand group has been systematically gathering up all of these old bones. Why? And why not admit it? But let's step aside from that for a minute and let's look at another situation. What is consciousness? Where are you? Think about it right now. We hear near-death experiences by people all the time who have passed over out of their body and they give very credible explanations of how they rose out of their body, had a physical form. They saw things in an operating room, for example, that you could not have seen from where they were lying physically in their body. Conversations, words that happened in a hallway just outside the door that you had to be there to hear it. 
and people say that they heard this word or that conversation or saw this person dressed a certain way, and they were in the operating room on the table. And very difficult to deny that they had had an experience that wasn't just an experience inside of the tissue of their gray matter, their brain, that they had somehow been transported or allowed to move about outside of their physical corpse. So then we ask ourselves, where are we? Where's our consciousness? Are you right now actually in your physical body or is it possible, is it conceivable that your conscious is somewhere maybe within the parameters of your physical body and more? So where's where's that consciousness? the world around us, and we say, no, 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 you know, the body, the consciousness, the physical, we're right here. I'm right here. But let's diverge again for just a moment. Years ago, before cloning was actually really known outside of a very tiny realm of people examining cloning issues, there was a dog that had been a pet, and that dog had uh, been well-known and would greet aircraft as they arrived and departed and, and the crews knew him. Had a very unique personality. Did some tricks and he was, he was just great. When he passed away, so years later, somebody had the idea that uh, it would be interesting to see if we could clone. So he was exhumed and DNA was extracted and then the animal was cloned. In one of those done, it was noticed that uh, the dog operated mannerism-wise and even to some tricks that it did as it was maturing as though it already knew these tricks that were really unique to its ancestor. And the question was, did that animal have that information in its DNA? Was that knowledge of how to do the tricks something that was recorded somehow in the DNA. Had the DNA been overwritten during the course of the dog's life to be able to know a trick and it somehow is recorded there like information like writing a movie onto a DVD or something and recording it on the DVD, had it somehow been recorded on the DNA? Conversely, the question was, was there something in the DNA that predisposed the dog to want to behave or operate or do things really just like the other dog the ancestor had? None of those seemed to make sense because the behaviors that we were looking at, that we're talking about, are learned behaviors. They did not seem to be things that you would have had within its DNA, how the animal was built at a structural level. This was more information related, things that would have been recorded in the mind. The question was, how could this dog have known these tricks? How could it want to follow these same paths when it hadn't been taught this stuff? It had not been shown it really to that point in time during this time that the previous dog wouldn't have known because the facilities are newer and had some new stuff and different people. So that animal died. They had decided to clone that animal. So now we have a clone of a clone. Plus we had still some work going on with the previous clone. And and the, and the interesting thing was to try and determine if there was some recorded information in the clone of the clone that was transmitted from one to the other. So these were really, you know, wild questions. I mean, this is, you know, strange stuff. We'll get to today in the world around us in a little while, but let's think about this question. Now this dog, who's a clone of a clone, and another dog that's just another clone of the original, are being raised isolated from each other. And an interesting thing is learned. The clone of a clone, as well as the original, both show some knowledge, some predisposition, acknowledgement of how to do a trick that had only been learned by that first clone. So how could a clone of the original dog and a clone of the clone both know this new same trick when there was no physical contact between them, there was no learned information between them, not being raised around that uh, dog at the middle. So that got me thinking, asking the question, well, what's the nature of consciousness? 
coming at it from a spiritual side, I said, well, but the consciousness isn't inside the body. It's coming from a remote location. Now, to most physicists, they're just looking at a brain and saying, nope, it's right there, it's the cells right there, there's a gray matter, we know this part of the brain transmits neurons this way, and it registers information here, and this is how it works, and they're looking totally inside the brain. They're looking inside the DNA as little recorders to see how it could be registered on the DNA and be written on the DNA. And I'm going, yeah, but the original, how could it possibly not? I'm trying to come at this and look at it and go, is there a real physics that, even if it isn't understood, is there a real physics, an underlying, testable, measurable, tangible physics here that we have to know, understand, graph? So now we say, okay, so, so there's stuff that makes up our world but we can't see it. But it's everywhere around us, totally infused in us. And it's even more real than the stuff that we see because it's much denser, it's much finer, it's much more powerful. But it's just out of reach. And what does it mean? And, you know, how is it relevant to us in this physical world? If I can't touch it, feel it, grab it, manipulate it, what's the matter? What's the matter with the matter? What's the matter? It's not relevant to me. Let's go back to consciousness. If you, your consciousness, actually isn't residing in your brain, isn't recorded in your brain, where is it recorded? If your body is, in fact, in a, in a way, an avatar that thought, moved, acted, reacted according to its input, its stimuli, remote control, an avatar. What if you are, in a sense, that way, and yet your consciousness isn't parked on the other side of Pluto? It's right there within the zone of your body, but in that dark matter. Very real. And I would propose to you that it's the DNA. Now, one of the interesting things about the DNA, when we look at the DNA, the picture that most people have in their mind is the double helix. The double helix is two strands that wind and twist and coil around each other. Two strands are connected side to side. What does it look like when we look at those strands in this ladder type arrangement and thought of the DNA strands as tuning forks all the way up, each of them hitting their own unique little combination note. And then you say, well, if I have tuning forks side by side, and I have them all vibrating, tend to affect the note of the one adjacent to them ever so slightly, especially when you have a whole bunch of them. All of these tuning forks hitting their individual notes tied together make a particular sound or signal that is totally unique because what? No two people's DNA is exactly the same unless you're a clone. And even clones vary just ever so slightly here and there, but uh, they're closer together to being an exact match. Now imagine if that DNA strand of which your body is made up of trillions of strands of DNA throughout all your cells essentially amounts to a note that's your unique note and your transmitter can communicate with your receiver individually and no one else. Now your consciousness resides between you and your body. You are tied together by this silvery thread umbilical cord to this physical body with your consciousness right now. It's a physics that's not normal physics the way you've been taught and raised to believe. It is measurable and it is detectable and it is manipulable if you understand how to do it. If you were communicating, let's say in the jungle a thousand years ago, maybe you used smoke signals and drums because that's what's available to you. You don't have an electronic you know, radio transmitter or receiver situation, so you've got to use drums and smoke signals. Does it mean that radio systems don't exist? Well, a thousand years ago, probably didn't exist. Does it mean they can't exist? No, we know that now. What, what, do, we, what do we have here? We have now established that there's a very good likelihood that a physics is real and exists and is provable that it exists, that is right around us all the time. And somebody 
figured that out. And some of how it works, we might consider spiritual and, and everything. Well, what's the word? Still based on real physics, real stuff. The spiritual dimension doesn't mean that it's totally just imaginary, vaporous, you know, whatever. So then we come back and we look at this situation and we think about consciousness. And now I have to go somewhere else for a minute and add one more part to the table of parts as we try to assemble this puzzle. Let's imagine a time somewhere far out into the future. Mankind is allowed to continue to evolve the way they're headed this second as the future of mankind, if these people are allowed to do what they want to do, what they're trying to do, what they're pushing us to do, he sees a future of transhumanists transferred into what? It might start out with a mechanical limb and download information that you can see optically from the Internet. It could be more direct. It could be some type of a chip that you plug right into your brain and suddenly you now can speak French instantly without learning a thing. It's just, bang, it's in your brain. Moving out into the future, download consciousness into a machine. And maybe it's not 500 years. Maybe portions of it are being downloaded right now. Perhaps you record your consciousness in such a way it can be able to exercise itself out in the machine as the capabilities show up, you know, 500 years from now. You know, there's people who have had their bodies freeze-dried at the instant of death or just before they would normally die, knowing that they had cancer or something else, and preserving their body in this state, knowing that technology continues to improve every day and paying to have their body held in this time capsule. Isn't that what the Egyptians were trying to do? Preserve that body well enough that somewhere down in the future they thought they could be reanimated. Perhaps they understood something that we only now are beginning to understand. If you can reanimate that DNA at some later point in time, you could have access to that knowledge bank, that data bank that is you, again, in this world. But you live eternally. Your being, everything that makes you up, is still there. Imagine a future, some distant place out there where mankind's abilities reach some incredible high point where your consciousness downloaded in some manner into a robot, into a being, into a machine. And in that machine, you don't know an end of life. Here I am looking at what is purported to be triple strand DNA. The lie was somebody was superior because they had triple strand DNA as opposed to double strand DNA. That was what they were taught. That's what they believed. And that that triple strand DNA made them different and in a positive way, better, superior. Strand DNA gave them certain knowledge, access, rights, because everybody that wasn't triple strand was different. So the question was, is it true? I mean, the technology to look at DNA has only really come on in the last 30, 40 years in any great, strong measure. So this was uh, still an emerging science a long time ago. For a moment, let's think about those people, those groups. How would they even have known or thought and have conveyed one to another to another over generations that they were different? Some unknowable way at the DNA level and yet they knew that they were genetically somehow different in a way that was not totally obvious to everyone. They just knew that there was something different and the difference was where? In the blood. The blood was different. There was a need to preserve a unique identity one generation to the next within your bloodline because there was something about the blood that made you different and you needed a pure bloodline to preserve that and accentuate it for some reason known only to your ancestors and to who might come down the road to use that knowledge 
to regain some high point that they had known before, going where someone has gone before. One of the interesting things in these secret societies, these families, are these rituals that they follow. Very bizarre ceremony that is conducted every 40 years with precision as Venus eclipses in this one location at a very precise time. And the light from Venus is lined up to come down into this chamber precisely as it comes down through the opening of this chamber, this long shaft. For a brief period of time, it passes in such a way, it shines literally like a, like a laser signal coming straight in to that chamber. What was happening inside that chamber at that time? This was about these sexual acts. Virgins, the high priest, would have sex with these girls and these women during that week and those days and within the high point of those moments on those particular days with particular emphasis at that time and hour. And the light from Venus would travel down that shaft precisely like a laser into that chamber area. And they had to have sex to commemorate that moment. How bizarre is that? What are you talking about? Heathens, heathens, heathens! But wait a second. You're thinking of it as a person who measures with light and electricity at the matter level. What about sub-subatomic matter? There's a torsion signal, and there's a disruption in the torsion signal during those events, and there's ways to focus that torsion signal. And in the ancient world, if you didn't understand all the physics and nobody could explain to you torsion and sub-subatomic materials and everything else, how would you preserve some knowledge of how some of the physics works and use that energy to your advantage at some critical point. And what did we see? A filament, another strand. It looks like another strand, DNA-like, and yet it's not a full strand. It's just a little short blurb of it. Nano size, unbelievable density of information in a very small space we know that there's a limit to how much information you can pack into a piece of given matter. So when we look at this thread that was there, intermingled, intertwined with the DNA strand, that was sitting there, seemingly attached at various places, we're going, well, that doesn't seem like it could have enough information to actually be something different, but it doesn't have to be all the information on the strand, if consciousness resides inside the body, what if your consciousness is somehow trapped because your body is physically dead and you want to get into another body so you can reanimate yourself and express yourself? You need to get your DNA reactivated. Do you suppose that those pharaohs, like our modern-day people that are having their bodies freeze-dried, are thinking that somewhere down the road, because of some new capability, might have their DNA merged with new beings at some later point in time and they could partially live again in some new DNA form. Their DNA could be preserved well enough to last down through the centuries till the technology arrived to take some of that DNA, reactivate it, if their ancestors in the future, their progeny, their offspring, understood, hey, I'm saving myself. Preserve me. When the time comes, reanimate me. I want to live again. And imagine us right now. What's being offered to us? Transhumanism. If we go down this road. But now I have one other question for you. What if... We're not talking about the future. What if this already happened in the past? Beings, creatures, humanoid. Not human because they aren't descendants of Adam, but beings nonetheless, humanoid beings, living creatures, had evolved, had grown, had become so technologically advanced that they once before were able to download their consciousness 
into machines. What would they have built? What if 10,000 years was just a starting point in your life? Think of how much we learn in, in a few years, a few decades. Adam and Eve living almost a thousand years. Imagine what they learned. The greatest scientist in uh, mankind's history was Adam. What would his knowledge and capability in the physical realm be? And what could he have built? I mean, the things, the machines could be unbelievable. If there was some humanoid presence, not human because they're not direct descendants of Adam and Eve, but humanoid, what if they lived here before and were destroyed, destroyed themselves? and there was some echo, some remnant of their history all around us, then you think about the physics and you think about these families and how they've recorded certain rituals into how they live from generation to generation. And I was talking to you earlier, Doug, about a tribe and tribes down in the South Pacific. And what happened with them was that when World War II occurred, the armies went down and they would occupy these islands. First people in there, they'd be these Navy Seabees and there'd be communications people and they would go in, land, seeming coming out of nowhere and to these natives that are living in the past in very low level civilization. They're wearing grass skirts if they're wearing anything at all. These people would come in and they'd make a little hut with a grass roof on it, and they'd put these machines in there, and they'd have radios that they're just a box, and it's boxes with, like, cords on them, and they have things they put on their ears, and then they talk certain funny language, certain code words. They do things, and there's a certain ritual, and the papers have to be laid out in a very precise way. And then suddenly, after they do the ritual in that little booth at that desk, they look up, and out of the sky come planes, and they land. And then people come out. Parachutes are dropped. Supplies and equipment come out of nowhere. And these people, they were there for a period of time, and then the war moved, and they went on. And the tribes that were there tried to duplicate what they saw, and it's called the cargo cult. And we come back years later to those same islands, having not visited them for 20, 30 years. And what do we find? The high priest in the radio communications hut, tapping out codes on the transmitter, speaking in the mic a certain way, looking up to the sky to see if the gods have returned. They preserved a ritual. They're called cargo cults because they thought that the guy in the room, in the radio room, in that shack, was the reason everything else occurred. They didn't understand the physics. They didn't understand the outside world. They recorded it their own way. They created a ritual around something that had nothing to do with reality. So what if we were looking at nanomachines from some pre-existing time that were still here present in our environment, had been intermingled in with DNA, human DNA, but because the signal strength that energizes it is random, static noise and it's only really clear at certain times during certain events wouldn't you want to try and get the people the natives to operate in precise ways during those events maybe encapsulated in a ritual so that they preserve in ways that they couldn't explain in the detail and they you can't explain it all to them and somebody forget to pass along a certain piece of information so you have to create the ritual edifice and chamber and isolate out the signal. Do these rituals in such a way because during that torsion event, that nano thread becomes energized, activated, moves more readily, and can be transmitted being to being down through time. And certain bud lines are more attuned naturally and by breeding to that. But now, let's think about what else are we looking at in our society today? Families working together, a hidden hand behind the scenes, managing the planet towards some future event, some new world order, some greater organization. And in those families, they have an understanding amongst themselves that they are different. They understood it, and it's been conveyed at different times in different ways. More recently, triple-strand DNA. Prior to that, a 
noble bloodline, but they have believed that they were aliens that fell to this earth. They somehow are trapped here because their ancestors came to earth and had to rebuild it in some way to just survive. Imagine our world today if something like an EMP happens. Could you build your car by yourself here today? How long before that car wouldn't run anymore? It's unusable anymore. Something happens and you can't repair it and the technology to repair it doesn't exist. It gets ground up. A couple of floods and all the technology that existed is wiped away and gone. All the buildings gone. And if we're talking thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, it gets wiped out. What you saw as a pyramid at one era might look like just a mountain in some later era. But imagine a world where technology was where we are right now plus a thousand years or 10,000 years, or 100,000 years. Those are blips in the history of our galaxy. What would we build? Machines the size of the moon. What do the Indian culture record with the Vimanu? Sky ships that could destroy whole cities. And it even shows what their power system looked like and describe a power system based on the Mercury propulsion system. Does it bother your Christian understanding? Does it destroy my ability to have faith in God or trust that Christ is my Savior? They were an accursed generation. Who are these Nephilim that are right there in the first book of the Bible? They are beings. They are consciousness. They exist just as we exist. Their consciousness is tied to our world and connected thinly now, but no less connected from some ancient primordial period. And they are trying to express themselves and reanimate themselves to escape their hell because they're trapped unless they can reanimate somehow in this realm with those that have the promise of life in this realm, the inheritors of this realm that God has placed here. Those giants were an accursed generation. They were under a curse. The history that these families believe in is that they fell to earth. And even their rituals, that you see right in front of you, I'll name an example, the 2012 Olympics. How did the highest ranking member of one of those bloodline families come to the event? For all the world to see a parachute. The queen jumped out of the helicopter, parachuted, fell to earth, duplicating how they originally got here in the first place. Why? Because they think they're different than us. They fell to earth from their celestial locations, from their higher technological era. They got here in their lifeboat and they're trying to build their way back to get where? Get home? Sirius? To some other star system? And when they got here, how did they preserve their life? They had to mate with what was here, be it apes or God's children, and create hybrids. But they always preserved the knowledge that they were different. It was suggested in a lot of the works, a lot of the writings, a lot of the information that we see that those first ones here, those ancient ones, were all male. And only through hybridization with the apes that were here were they able to preserve their DNA down to the generations to be reconcentrated at a later point in time. If they were as intelligent, as evolved, as I'm saying to you, what, if they were 50,000 years in advance of us ecologically or 10,000 or 1,000? With where we are right now with nanotechnology, would they have nanotechnology? And they had discovered and learned how to manipulate at the nano level, and they understood torsion. And because at the torsion level, at the sub-subatomic level, the energy density is a trillion, trillion times greater than it is at the matter level, they would use the higher density material to their advantage. So their equipment, their machines run on torsion energy. And if you're in a world where there's no machines to maintain and emit and broadcast the torsion signal coherently, you have to use and incorporate into the minds of the people that you're presented with, your hybrids that you create 
for them to preserve certain understandings so down the road as the planet gets built back out and as the natural progression, the natural build out of technology occurs over time, the civilization that would come, that it would focus on those torsion energy moments, those torsion energy transfer moments where your little machines could work better so that at some later point in time, you could be reanimated in a rebuilt world. And if you live for a thousand years, 10,000 years, a hundred thousand years, eternally in a machine existence, 10,000 years for the planet to rebuild up to a technological level where you could begin to function normally, your normal again, well, it's 10,000 years. You expect to live a million because you expect never to die. Any amount of time is not too long. It's just what you have to do because that's what's available to you. Preserving that knowledge in some way, arcane as it might be, so that your progeny, millennia removed from you, might recognize and understand and see the code that you left so you can live again in those families to preserve that connection to the past because no. they themselves are deceived into believing that they're just a biological bloodline that's different to tell from space. They don't see the consciousness behind it all manipulating them the way it is. They're trying to create an existence outside of the ability of God to capture their, their consciousness, punish them, and judge them. Well, remember, how do they identify themselves amongst themselves? Let's think about the garden for a minute. In the garden... The serpent enticed Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge. In the course of that, which there's wonderful discussion, let's just try to think about for a second. The allegation that has been made at some levels, at a Kabbalistic level, is that Eve got pregnant first by Satan, who deceived her in the garden and impregnated her. And then she had sex with Adam and conceived Abel and that the two were conceived essentially simultaneously in the same day or days, which physically is possible. Two different children, two genetically separate children, same mother, during the same menstrual cycle. That has been a common belief for a long time. Cain and Abel actually had different fathers with the same mother. And that Cain, being genetically different, looked different, was different, and that his father would come and talk with him, enticed him, said, you know, if Abel's dead and there's no other children, you inherit the whole world. It's all yours. And he was enticed somehow to believe that story, that lie, whatever. Somehow he was caught by that. But more importantly, and remember, for those that are saying, oh, I don't, I don't see that in the scripture. Does, I don't see that anywhere in the scripture. Understand, true or not, these people identify themselves as children of Cain. In fact, the children of Israel went to where? Cain and land and displaced those people there and took it for themselves at God's direction. And what was there in Canaan land? But think about what those giants represent. Hold on a second. Those giants are genetically different. They're humanoid, but they're not human. And yet it's called Canaan land. When Cain was exiled from his family and had to go off into a far-off city and took for himself a wife, well, where did those people come from? Oh, there were other kids that Adam and Eve had that uh, weren't talked about in the Bible. Really? And it was a city? We have, even now today, all sorts of archaeological records of real buildings, real cities, real stuff that's older than we can account for by the genealogy given in the Bible back to Adam and Eve. And either the Bible is true or it's false. We know all the descendants from Christ back to Adam through David are you saying there's a bunch of people missing or something was skipped? Or is it approximately 6,000 years? If it is, then we have real stuff that we can touch and feel and hold and look at and measure 
undeniable. And if you're going to deny it, then we probably don't need to have any more conversation. You don't want to live in the real world. Real civilizations were here over 6,000 years ago. Humanoids, not human, direct descendants of Adam. So if that's true, are they the last civilization? Were they the first one? Or were they the tenth one? Or were they the hundredth one? The evidence appears to show conclusively at this point in time that the world has been destroyed multiple times, that civilization has come and gone several times here on the earth. What is different about this time from a biblical perspective, from a biblical narrative, is that God has promised, made a covenant with Adam and his seed. Notice it doesn't say Eve and her seed. It specifically says Adam and his seed. And these people, these families, these 13 families, they laugh and communicate amongst themselves and make jokes about reptilians among us. It's code. Reptilian is code for children of Cain. Reptilian is code for children of Satan, the other bloodline. And if that other bloodline is actually consciousness tied to some prior civilization through technology, through physics, real, honest, to goodness, measurable, testable, provable physics, and transferable by tiny machines manipulating the DNA, nano machines, and the rituals are tuned based on the alignment of celestial bodies, real physics, that then allow for that information transfer, that nano machine transfer from one generation to the next to, to manipulate the DNA, to focus the signal, to preserve the access to the physical world from that remote consciousness, wherever it may reside. It doesn't have to be, in its case, totally consciousness like ours is. Perhaps its consciousness is revealed to us to be coming from someplace else. So let's say that some prior civilization, individually and in mass, had downloaded their consciousness into machines. How would they express themselves over time? They would do what they know, do what they are, do what comes natural, build out machines, act like machines, with the morals of a machine. Do it because you can. Do it because you desire to. Do what comes naturally. Do what you will. It's nature. It's being is expressing itself. It's having a little joke. And what are we doing? We're building out its ability to retake control to re-express itself, to reanimate itself from some remote location, be it in a sub-subatomic world or in some silicon machine on some remote distant location. It's trying to preserve the bloodline because in the blood of those reptilian family, going back to its ancient ancestor at Cain and his father, is being merged and condensed and focused so that some future person will be so closely aligned, so closely manipulated in the way that its DNA can access and be an avatar of that signal, that it is literally the physical embodiment of that consciousness from a remote location. And what does it purport to do? Save the world, save the planet, save the people. Which people? It's people. It is the reptilian Christ for their alien hybrid race versus the children of Adam, which it sees as the invader, because God planted Adam and Eve in the garden to displace that accursed generation that would not give God the glory thereof, because they believed that their salvation could exist apart from God's blessing. They could do it whether God allowed them to or not, or was in on it or not, or blessed them or not because they could be a machine consciousness and be eternal without connection to an eternal God. They would be like God, eternal, in this realm, in this physical matter world. And that's what the whole appeal of this transhumanism that Steve Quayle talks about is to these people. If we build the machines soon enough, precisely enough, we can download our consciousness there and we don't have to worry about an eternal hell. 
We don't have to worry about an eternal damnation. We'll live forever. Damn God. We will be gods. The God of this world. Because they want to own the future. They do not want to be subject to God's judgment. And remember, in all of what we're saying here, if you don't agree with what I've just laid out for you, can't find it in scripture, don't get the eschatology, don't think that this is what's really there. It doesn't matter. It's not about what you believe or even what is true or not. It's what they believe. And their belief is the driver of their action. These families are communicating one to another. We are an alien race. We are superior to the sons and daughters of Adam. We are stuck here with these apes that we created, we gave knowledge to. They're to us like cattle are to a farmer. They live at our pleasure and discretion. And if they become a threat, cows with guns, then you need to cull the herd, manage the problem, let be overrun, so that they preserve their identity. And that's why this is two different races, whether they really exist or not. In their minds, a culture has been preserved, has been inculcated by some satanic genius to believe that they're different and to operate as though they're different and they must protect themselves from the rest of us. The life is in the blood. For them, in order to preserve themselves, they had to hybridize. Why? Because they were under a curse. And in order to escape the curse, in their minds, what they had to do was hybridize with the humans that were under God's blessing. And if God had not wiped out the earth at the time of Noah, there would be no flesh left that wasn't corrupted. Why did Cain have to kill Abel? Because if there was no uncorrupted flesh and God had promised the earth to Adam and his seed, had Cain turned and then killed Adam, God could not be God and bless Adam and his seed without destroying that blessing by destroying Cain. He would have to have hybrids and then God wouldn't be God anymore. He couldn't make a promise to Adam that he could keep. And that's why it says in the Bible that the end days will be like as in the days of Noah. The hybridization, if they can destroy man till only the reptilians, the hybrids, are left, then God has to bless the hybrids or God's not God anymore. It's a catch-22. And they believe that they need to eliminate anybody, anyone who is not a hybrid. That's their plan. It's said at the Great White Throne Judgment that all the people look upon this being in awe and astonishment and wonder and ask amongst themselves, is this the one that deceived the whole world? This pathetic creature? This is what deceived the whole world? deceived us and manipulated us into wars and destruction and cataclysm. It destroyed its worlds several times. It's accursed. Their consciousness is downloaded into machines and still now reaches out across time to try and hold back and destroy God's children even now, even yet, as it has done before. God's promise to Abraham is that his seed will be as the sand of the seashore, innumerable by number. God has promised Abraham and his seed, not just to populate the earth out through time, but to populate eternity out through the galaxy by number and by dimension. But first, this cancer, this consciousness, this evil being, this destructive being that has destroyed its worlds over time, back into eons, must be capped, choked off, cut off forever into its eternal electronic hell. And those that will not place their trust in the blood of Christ, in the program that kills the virus, if you want to put it in those kind of terms, if you will not identify with Christ, to eliminate the virus from your program, then 
you have to spend eternity with that evil consciousness and this virus hell where it plays and replays and re-goes through all of its machinations over and over and over for eternity. It's gone. And you with it. Trapped. God is providing a future for us. And the life is in the blood. And the life is in the blood of Christ. And the correction for the virus in the program is the blood of Christ and right relationship with God. It's a machine consciousness. The devil and his angels our captured psyche, trying to express themselves in our physical world as best they can to capture, possess bodies like avatars to reanimate themselves for a period of time or maybe be reborn to relive. What do we have right now with all those families, all those royal families? We have one person who has the combined blood of all the families focused down on him. And what is the number of his name when you add the letters together with their numerical value? 666. So now, they aren't hiding who their replacement is. The hidden hand. We're looking at the Masonic Christ. And he's coming out of the city that is the new Rome. And we have to be taken out of the way so he can reemerge and bring peace back to the world out of chaos that's about to hit us. And all the money from those banks over there will be converted to a new kind of money that the machine values, that the beast values. And we take the mark of the beast and it allows us to live on its energy. We live and breathe and exist at its whim and will. Machine consciousness. Think if any of this makes sense. I would pray about it and understand the politics because this is what they believe and this is how they're expressing themselves. And all the politics, all the physics, everything we see is an extrapolation of this right down to the blood and the machines that live in the blood and exist trying to manipulate us from these families. I would pray that everyone who hears this understand if I've thrown out some fish bones and it's hard to digest this and it doesn't make sense to you, just set them off to the side of your plate. Don't choke on it. Don't be afraid of it. We're having a conversation here. W, thank you for being so gracious with your time. I just want to say God bless you. Yes. My goodness, this is fabulous. Thank you, sir. Good night. Ed. All right. Good night, Good night folks. Thanks, W.